The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Easter to all of you. And uh, he did defeat the uh, death. Excuse me, my earbuds messing me up here. <laughs> um, he defeated death, hell, and the grave, and that is why we celebrate this morning. So if you're able to, and if you're not already standing, please go ahead and stand at this time. Thank you to those of you watching online with us. We are so glad that you chose to uh, spend your Easter morning with us. But would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and all honor and all glory this morning, God. Thank you for what you did on the cross for us, Jesus. Thank you doesn't seem enough. But Lord, we, in this time, in this place, we give back to you. And we thank you for the joy and the hope that your resurrection gives to each and every one of us who choose to follow you and call you Lord. May you be honored. May you be glorified this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
Great. 
Yes? Amen. <laughs> the dark tried to hide you and steal you away. And death tried to keep you inside of the grave.
we thank you that there is nothing that can stop you. There's nothing that we can do. There's, there's nothing that you cannot take care of for us, God. We just, we thank you for the truths that we've heard from you this morning and the lyrics that we've sung. And uh, Lord, I just ask at this time that you prepare our hearts to uh, take communion, Lord. Will you just minister to all of us at this time? In Jesus' name, amen. If you've not grabbed your communion yet, please take time to do so. Isaiah 53 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus, when he was going to the cross, when he was on trial, he did not open his mouth. He did not try to make it to where he didn't die on the cross. He could have easily hired a lawyer and, and made his way out, and he was innocent. He had an easy case. He was innocent, but he willingly took our pain and our affliction and our sorrow and our sin, and he bore it on the cross, and he did that willingly. He didn't try to negotiate. People, when they walked up by him when he was on the cross, began to mock him and said, you're the son of God, why don't you come down? And the fact is, Jesus could have come down from that cross. But that wasn't the plan. That wasn't the rescue plan from the beginning. Jesus did not come so that he could show his power of coming off that cross. He came to show the power that in three days he was going to rise from the dead and defeat death once and for all for all of us who believe in him. And so every week here at Valley Mills, we celebrate that Jesus willingly died on the cross. He didn't fight when, even when Peter went and sliced the guy's ear off who was trying to arrest him, Jesus went and healed the guy, told Peter to put the sword away because he willingly died for you and I. He could have saved himself, but then he couldn't save all of us. And that's what we celebrate, and that's what this juice and this bread signifies, that blood that was poured out for us willingly, that body that was broken for us willingly. Would you pray with me? Dear God, just thank you that you willingly died for us. You could have came down from that cross to save yourself, but you wanted to save us. Dear God, Easter is so much more than we could ever imagine. It's all about how you defeated death for us. You died for us and you conquered death for us. Help us to remember that. Help us to understand that while we take this juice and eat this bread. In your name, amen. Matthew 26, 26 says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of all of it. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. We have one more song this morning before we hear the word, so feel free to sit if you'd like to stand you'd like to sing, if you'd like to just listen, whatever you feel on your heart, and this is your time with the Lord. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance, when death was arrested and my life began.
chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes the Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes had something that looked bad initially that eventually turned out for the good. Uh, this happened to me recently. I was shopping a couple weeks ago in Meyer, and you know, they had these Oreo cookies, two for seven dollars. Now, I remember when you could buy two for four dollars, so the price has gone up just fractionally, right, to some extent. But anyhow, it was too good to pass up. I normally don't eat Oreos because I am an addict. So if I eat too many Oreos, strange things happen to my body. So I normally have shied away from Oreos, but this day, they just kind of got me with that advertising, that little round cookie with the, you know, white stuff inside. So I said, okay, I'm gonna give it a, a, a try. This can't be bad. I mean, it looks so good, right? Let's give it a try. So I got those things, took them home, and you know, <clears throat> waiting in the refrigerator for those Oreo cookies was the milk. So it looked so good. It was good. The problem is, within two days, I had mowed through an entire box of Oreos. So what started out to be good was kind of, I mean bad, in that, in that it was, you know, probably not good for me actually uh, ultimately turned out for the good, and I'll tell you how that happened in just a moment. So it turned out that I began to have this awareness that, you know what, it, it probably is bad. So on the third day, I actually 
took the second box, and you'll see here, and I did what with it? It's in the trash can. This is the second box of Oreos. It's in the trash can, and guess what? It still has cookies in it, but because I knew it was going to be bad, I decided to just discard them. You know, uh, Bob doesn't need to mow through them and, you know, secretly hide them from Robin, but you know what happened? Earlier or later that day when I went to the office, I got to thinking like, you know what? These Oreos were created for a purpose. They were created for a reason. Why should I throw something good away? So I called Robin or texted her and I said, hey, you know, I put this second box of Oreos in the trash and they don't belong there. And, you know, I kind of have had second thoughts. Would you get them out of the trash for me, you know, kind of wipe it down and just set the box on the counter so that when I get home, I can merge the Oreos and the milk together. What started out probably would be to be a bad thing actually turned out to be a good thing. However, it was still bad because look what happened when I got home. <laughs> the box was sitting out, but there were no cookies in it. Now, Robin certainly couldn't have eaten through them all. I'm like, no way, she wouldn't do that. She had then taken them out of the box and I saw them all lying individually in the trash can. <laughs> Now, what individual would really reach down in there and start eating them? It certainly wasn't me. I mean, like if, you know, some of you can attest, if you want to have a piece of my dessert, all you got to do is reach over and just take your finger and poke it in my dessert. Like, nope, it's yours. You can have it. <laughs> Same thing with the Oreos. I wasn't going to reach down in there and grab them. And you know, the truth of it is, Robin actually helped me. She helped me that day because I really didn't need another box of Oreos and milk, you know, two boxes in four days. So she saved me. What initially looked to be bad, an empty box was actually good. Approximately 2,000 years ago, what looked like the darkest day in history actually three days later became the greatest miracle, the greatest hope that the world had ever seen or has ever known. You see, it was Friday, but Sunday had come. Er early Christians in the first century, they had anticipated a coming Messiah for hundreds of years, a Messiah that would come and would re redeem them from the curse of Death and sin. You know, the Bible tells us that everyone sins. All of us here today, we have this thing called sin. It's a common thread. Some are better at it than others. And Jesus came to redeem us from sin. The Bible tells us that all have sinned. And the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is what? Death. So Jesus came to redeem us from sin the curse, the penalty of sin, which separates us from God, and then he came to redeem us from death. Sin leads to death. Your sin leads to consequences, and it does for me too. Jesus came to bring us out of that. He came to redeem us from sin and from death. Now, there's two types of death. There is the physical death that we're all going to encounter one day, and then there's the spiritual death, which is after we die physically, it's the separation from God for all of eternity. And Jesus came to redeem us from sin and from death. What initially looked, looked terribly bad, the Messiah, the Son of God, on a cross, on a Friday, initially turned out to be such an amazing thing, the greatest event in all history. On the third day, when he resurrected from the grave by God's power, giving us that resurrection power and hope ourselves. He came to heal, love, forgive, to befriend, to encourage. And at age 33, he willingly gave his life on a cross so that we, all of mankind, 
could have hope because he took our penalty upon himself. Jesus, the perfect son of God, came to imperfect men and women like me and you who deserve nothing but was given everything, life, love, forgiveness, and the promise of eternity. You know, the older I get, the more I start to think about eternity. When I was young, you, you, you didn't even think about, you know, the future as far as, hey, one day this world as I know it is going to be different. It's not going to exist. I'm not going to exist in the same way. And as you get older, you begin to realize this life is temporal. And those of you, those of you who have encountered hardship, physical, maybe physical illness, you've lost loved ones, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who haven't, but you've observed others, maybe the pain of suicide, the pain of you know, someone going through an incredibly scary time, an automobile accident. We, the longer we live, know what it's like to grieve, but most of the people on earth don't know what it's like to live. Most people, I don't think, know what it's like to have hope. Today, we're here to celebrate hope. We're here to celebrate something that is not temporal, something that is going to last through all eternity. Gary Johnson from Indian Creek put out a video series about heaven called The Best is Yet to Come. And I truly have been blessed as our life group has recently studied this series and realized with anticipation, the best is yet to come. I mean, your best day on earth, the most beautiful thing you've encountered on earth is nothing compared to what's to come, what God is preparing and planning for all who believe. Jesus, the greatest man in all of history, unequivocally, he had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicine, yet they called him healer. He had no armies, yet kings feared him. He had no military battles, and yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, and yet they buried him. And he was buried in a tomb, and yet he lives today. Matthew 27 tells us about the darkness of death. It's a reality that we all must face. Matthew 27, 45 through 50. Now on the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Darkness, think about that. There was darkness. You know what it's like? We got an eclipse coming up pretty soon, and some of you like, have already bought your glasses and, and whatever. You know, I, I'm not going to buy glasses because I'm going to just stare at the sun and, you know, blind myself, right? Is that the right thing to do? No, I, I, I don't even know, like, where you go to get glasses because there apparently are some out there that aren't even the right kind of glasses, and so you could probably be looking and burning your eyes, you know, so I'm not even going to look at it. I'm just going to be like looking out, and then the next couple minutes, I'm going to turn a light on, or maybe I'm going to walk outside, and then you'll hear all the critters starting to chirp and all kinds of different sounds, and right when everything aligns, I might just look up and say, oh, that's cool, but I'm not going to take a chance on getting some glasses that were made in China. Oh, I'm sorry. Probably everything's made in China, right? But we've got an eclipse coming. But let me tell you what, that darkness is just temporary. And you know, some conspiracy theorists have thought, well, right at the exact moment it crosses Indianapolis, during those four minutes, something crazy is going to happen. Some insane terrorist attack. And you know, maybe that could happen. But you know, in my mind, my pea brain mind, you know what I'm thinking? This thing starts, I don't know, way down in Texas, and it continues on up kind of like northeast. Like every city, every state that it moves, and it lasts for three or four minutes, like, 
wait a minute, there's like something that could be happening all along if somebody wanted to do something in a conspiratorial way. So like what would make it that it right here, it's going to, you know, and it doesn't make sense to me. I, I, I think there's going to be craziness going on, but we, we don't have no reason to fear four minutes as it's passing through Indianapolis. We just need to know that it's kind of a unique thing and maybe we're going to have a good time. Maybe you're going to have a little party at your house. I don't know. But the darkness that we really need to be aware of is the darkness of death. Now, in the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? Now, God didn't forsake Jesus, but for just a moment, when Jesus bore our sin, God, I believe, had to turn his back. Verse 47, and some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge filled with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. It was a dark hour. It was a dark moment. We call that Good Friday. It was really a dark day, a day when Jesus was crucified and the disciples were plunged into despair. Some of them, most of them, did not understand what was going on. You know, it was, it's called Good Friday, actually, because of what is to come. What's to come? Sunday was coming. It was Friday, but Sunday was coming. The promised Messiah was dying, and some understood it, but most did not. It felt like the end. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like something so big, so heavy is occurring in your life, like it's literally the end? That's how it must have felt for those who didn't understand that Sunday was coming. Darkness fell. His friends scattered. Death thought that it had won, but heaven just started counting to three. We not only have the darkness of death, we have the dawn of the resurrection. The dawn of the resurrection. Now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Verse 3, his appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and because like, became like dead men. Do you know why the guards trembled that were guarding the body of Jesus? They trembled because they had an actual encounter with an angel. It wasn't like a dream when you wonder, did that really happen? This was like real life, like a lightning bolt hitting you in the head. I mean, it was something so real that the guards, these were not wimpy men. These were manly men. They were guarding the body of Jesus. Why? So that nobody could steal him and then everyone say, ah, oh, I told you he did resurrect after all. Matter of fact, the guards, the Roman guards, they're standing there and they're guarding the tomb. You know why? Because not only did they want someone, not want someone to take the body of Jesus, and then the Christians say, ah, look, he is resurrected. But they, their very lives hinged on whether or not they successfully did that. If they did not accomplish their mission of guarding the tomb, their very lives would be at stake. And so for fear of the angel, the guards, the guards trembled. Everyone trembled at the guards, but the guards did not tremble at anyone. 
And yet when they came face to face with that angel of God, the guards trembled. And they became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Isn't it interesting? The guards were trembling, but the angels saying to the women who knew Jesus and the men, he's giving them a message that you and I need to hear today. Fear not. Don't be afraid. In your darkest hour, in your weakest moment, in your most agonizing moment of despair, don't fear. What's it like to fear? You know what it's like. It, it's not just a thought. Eventually, the fear begins to envelop your entire body, and you begin to, to increase, your blood pressure increases. You begin to have, uh, you know, s- sweat coming out of your pores. You, you begin to have anxiety and possibly panic attacks. You, you begin coming unnerved. Fear turns into something literally out of control. And here is the angel coming to those who knew Jesus and said, hey, fear not. It's Friday, but now it's Sunday. Sunday has come. There is no need to fear. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. What? He is risen as he said. Because of the resurrection, we have fear conquering hope both in this life and beyond this life. Let me say that again. Because of the resurrection, we have fear conquering hope both now and into tomorrow because of the resurrection. We have fear conquering hope. This life is meant to be lived. But in your darkest hour, you do not have to fear. You don't have to come apart at the seams. You don't have to be undone. If your world falls apart, the best is yet to come. Sunday has occurred. We see the power of redemption. Romans 6, 4 reminds us that we were therefore buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk a new life. We believe, we accept, we turn towards God, we're baptized into a water which is literally not something that the water is doing. The water is a picture. It's a symbol. It's an element of connectivity to your faith step to follow Jesus. Romans 6 says, therefore, just as you know, Christ died, we were, we were therefore buried with him by baptism into death. You're not physically dying. You're surrendering to God. There's a, a, a death of self. Self is what gets in my way most of the time. It's not someone else's fault. It's my fault. So when I surrender to Jesus, I am in a sense dying to myself so that why? I can become alive to God in order that just as Christ was what? Raised from the dead so we too may walk a a new life, a different life, a better life, a different path. When by faith we receive his grace and forgiveness, and even in our baptism, we're reminded of the transformative power of the resurrection. There is nothing greater as far as an event in all of history than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
the resurrection. How many parents who've lost a child would love to see that child come back to life? How many people who've lost loved ones, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, an aunt, an uncle, a close friend, how many of you would would love to see that friend come back to life? The Bible tells us that because of the resurrection of Jesus, that those who believe in him, we are not destined for death. We will, in this body, turn back to our original state, which was nothing. But our soul and our spirit live on. We are given a new heavenly body. We are going to have the ability to uh, interact and identify with one another in heaven. We will know and be known in heaven. We will be in the presence of God in those who are part of his family. There is power through the resurrection and redemption. We're saved, we're forgiven, we're set free. So we can take a breath. We can look up and say, God, I don't know how to make it through this day, but I trust you. I trust you. The best is yet to come. I might feel like I'm dying, but I'm really living when I keep my eyes on you. I keep my mission pointed towards you. Every day we must wake up with this awareness that you're either living for yourself or you're living for God or you're serving Satan. It it can't be many other things. You're either living for yourself, you're living for God, or you're serving Satan. And when we serve God, it's gonna feel contrary. It's going to feel contrary to the flesh because many times the flesh is contrary to the spirit. So we must know that. As long as we're living in this body, in this fleshly body, we have a a new mindset. We are saved, but we're still living in this fleshly body. We still have this fleshly mindset. That's why Paul tells us to be transformed by what? The renewing of our mind. The renewing of our mind. The renewing, and the only way we can do that is on scripture and through prayer. The power of redemption. We have also the assurance of hope. 1 Peter 1 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance, to an inheritance. Some of you would like to inherit something that's not yours. Some of you would like to be given something that you think is going to make you happy. God, his desire is not to just give you a million dollars. Just what do you think we would do if we inherited a million dollars? God may not have blessed you to be the, the best looking man in the room, even though I know if I were to ask right now, everyone's hand would go up and say, no, I am the best looking man in the room. Because what, 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 what would happen? God may not have given you the athleticism that our beloved student minister Craig Rice possesses when he played football in the big town of Brazil. Was that a six-star six school? Is that right? Four? Come on. Three now. You left and it all went downhill. God may not give you Something that is going to temporarily ring your bell. Because you know what? God doesn't want us attached to this world. God doesn't want us attached to ourselves. God wants us to be in love with him. And him 
alone. Why do things break? I don't know. I get so frustrated. Why, why do things break? Why do things rust out? Why do you plant something in your garden, in you know, your landscape around your house, and then next year the weeds are growing up? I, I don't know. If, if you get an answer, you, you, you will be a millionaire. I, I get tired about the same. Why does the house you know, begin to look moldy after a couple of years and you gotta pressure spray it. Yes, we have a vinyl house, not a brick house like all of you, but sorry about that. Why do these think, why does the car always need to go to a shop? Why can you never find an auto repair mechanic you can't trust? I, this world is not our home. There's, there's a certain discomfort we must become comfortable with because this is not our home. God didn't design life to be about us or to be about how cozy it is down here. Actually, he did create it that way, but in chapter three of Genesis, we messed it up. We messed it up. So what you see in Genesis 21 and 22 is in heaven, God is going to restore things to their original state and perhaps yet even much, much better than that. God doesn't want you to get attached to this world. He doesn't want you to get attached to yourself. He doesn't want you to get attached to your riches. He didn't want you to get attached to things that are going to rust, fade away. People are going to steal. He wants you to be attached to him because those who put their faith and trust in him, those who believe in Jesus on the cross, they're for you and me to give us a way to God. How can I stand before God? It's only through Jesus Christ. The assurance of hope. Look at verse four and five. To an inheritance that is imperishable, Im, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. This hope sustains us through every trial and every challenge we face. It is Friday, but Sunday has come. It's open and offered to anyone who would accept it, who would believe and repent. Christianity compares to no other religion because of one person, Jesus Christ, risen from the grave, waiting for us, Preparing a mansion in heaven for all of us. Do, do you believe today? Would you surrender and follow? Your peace, your joy, your hope, your future depends on this one person and your response to him. Sunday has come. It's Resurrection Sunday. Are you part of the redeemed? Are you part of those who believe, or will you be a part of those who continue to deny and reject and push away our Savior? Sunday has come, and I want to know if you would come, and would you join? Not just join a church, not just join some people, but would you join the family of God? It comes through simple faith, like God, I don't have all the answers, but I know you do, and I'm going to give over my life to you. I'm going to surrender to you. I'm going to invite you to come in and help me so that I can know that I have eternal life, so that when this life is over, I know I will be with you in heaven, so that when this life is over, I know the best is yet to come, and I'm going to be a part of the redeemed. I'm going to stand face to face with my creator. I'm going to put my stock in someone, in something that will never fade. On the other hand, you could turn your back on the cross. You could turn the back, your back on Jesus and you could walk away. And you could say, yeah, you know, it's just another Sunday, just another sermon, just another man who died. The Bible tells us that all of us are going to have to stand before God. You know that? All of us. Every single one of us, every one of you sitting here, you're going to have to stand before God. 
And if God were to say, why should I let you in heaven, what would you say? What would you say? Oh, I'm a good person. Nope. That is not going to cut it. It's only going to be because you have put your faith and trust in Jesus. He took all of our sin and he nailed them to that cross. And then on the third day, he rose again, reminding us that he has power not only over physical death, but over this thing called spiritual death, which is separation from God. We can put our hope and faith in him and we can live life and we can know the best is yet to come. That's why I don't fear death. We don't have to fear darkness. Satan's going to torment you. He's going to play with your mind all of your life, but you don't have to fear. All you've got to do is believe, surrender, and just follow. And God never called us to do this thing alone. He called us to be a family. He called us to come together, to be friends, to be brothers and sisters. The family of God, as blessed and as imperfect as we are, we're here I hope you're part of the family of God. If not, you can come forward today and you can talk to us about what that means. You can talk to us throughout the week. There's a prayer room if you'd like to come and pray with somebody. Let's all stand up as we sing our song of decision today.
as snow. Oh, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. snow. Amen. So good to see each of you today. On your way out, feel free to stop by any of our information tables. Uh, if you're a guest today, we give you a warm welcome, and you can stop out at our newcomer uh, table on the left, and you can get a gift bag, and there you'll find some information about our church. We encourage everyone to fill out a Connect card, either online or through uh, physically, and just drop it at the counter. They're letting us know about your, your attendance today, any prayer requests. Uh, any updated information or anything you would like to share with us. Also, we are not taking an Easter offering today, but we invite you to take and give above and beyond your normal tithes and offerings this week and just give to someone else. Take someone out to lunch. Encourage them. Express generosity. God has given us so much. We invite you to do the same with others around you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for being the one who paid our debt and who lives and is the author of life. God, help us to believe in you, to accept you into our hearts, to walk with you all the days of our life. Even if the days seem dark, God, with you, we have life. We have it abundantly. And God, help us today to be grateful for Jesus that he would give his life, God, that you would let a part of you come down to this earth to redeem us, to, to push us out of the way and say, no, I'm going to go to the cross in your place. God, thank you today. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed day.